Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Chrysler, teaching communication systems at Idaho State University. In this series of videos, we will be discussing signal energy and energy spectral density. Uh, much of the material uh, in these videos can be learned as well using this textbook, Modern Digital and Analog Communications, which is seen here on the right. So let's talk about signal energy and energy spectral density. Uh, we're going to start off with a review of energy and power signals. We're going to do this because in 3.7, we'll discuss signal energy, and we will use every aspect of the signal energy understanding to build our knowledge up so that we can understand the same ideas for power signals. So we'll start with signal energy, we'll learn several ideas, and we'll apply them to power signals. The first of these ideas is the Parseval's theorem, which is a method of understanding signal energy and its relationship between the time and frequency domain. Then we will discuss energy spectral density, which is a way of understanding the energy contained in a frequency bandwidth of a signal. We will also discuss the essential signal, signal bandwidth which is a way of understanding how much bandwidth contains most of a signal's energy. We'll also discuss the energy of modulated signals, which is important because we will continue our discussion later on modulation of signals. And so understanding what that does to a signal's energy is going to become more and more important. And lastly, we will shortly discuss the time autocorrelation function and energy spectral density. The time autocorrelation function uh, is a bit complex and is uh, not going to be covered in much detail here, but the reason that we should discuss it is because this autocorrelation function makes it a lot easier to understand power signal concepts and it's easier to first learn it by applying it to energy signals. So before we begin or get too much further, let's quickly review the difference between energy and power signals, what this is, and why we care about them. So first, the idea behind both of these is we want, we're going to ask ourselves, how can you reduce a time varying signal? So this is a, a signal that is changing in time, right? Every, every place in time, right? You have a time um, domain and something's changing, right? And so you can describe this signal by describing uh, what its amplitude is in time. So you can probably write it like this, where at each different time you have a different value. But what if we want to reduce this whole signal into uh, one single number that could indicate the size or strength of the signal? So how could we reduce this into a single number? And the answer is that we can do this by defining some terms for signal energy or signal power. And we'll start off with signal energy, and then uh, due to the limited applications of signal energy, we'll also define a signal power. So for signal energy, we can define the energy of a signal as the square of the function integrated across all of time. So clearly, if you integrate something from minus infinity all the way to infinity. That's a long time. That's an infinite amount of time. So if you want this, if this is going to be an actual number, a finite number, and not infinity, you're going to need a signal that has uh, some some special properties to it. So uh, that those this these signals, uh, in order to have a finite value for this energy, uh, are going to need to uh, be defined to a, a few special properties. And in addition to just calling it the square of the signal, we can further expand this to the complex square, uh, which can also be written uh, as this way. So these are all equivalent ways of, of expanding our understanding for various types of signals. And all of them, we're integrating from minus infinity to infinity. So let's think about what type of function we would need to have. So whether it's, it's a pure real function or a complex function. Let's think about what type of function we would need to have in order to get a finite value for this energy. And so the answer for that is that if you want this to uh, be a finite value, 
then you're going to need a signal where g of t equals zero for a very long time, or in fact, uh, some kind of infinite amount of amount of time, or at least approaches zero uh, for a long time. Uh, so you're going to need a signal, a signal property that um, is basically confined to some uh, area in the time domain, so that a lot of the signal uh, is is equal to zero, and uh, is is one of the most common ways to to think about this. Um, so this would be something like a single pulse or a function that uh, approaches infinity uh, on either direction. If you don't have a signal like this, so if you have a signal that is is constantly oscillating or or going back and forth, never never reaching a a limit, then you're going to be dealing with a need to deal with another type of signal because if your signal does not equal zero for a long amount of time or approach zero, then this integral is going to be uh, equal to infinity. So if you, you, you can dis define an energy signal as a signal where when you take this integral, you get a finite number. Now, if you don't get a finite number, you're going to be dealing with a power signal. So the best way to do deal with power signals is to expand this definition. And instead of taking an integral from minus infinity to infinity, you'll choose some period t that you'll integrate over. And you will take the limit as t approaches infinity, again, with the square of this function. And so this, for a power signal, this will be a finite number. So if you cannot take this integral and get a finite answer, then you have a power signal, and you should deal with it by taking this integral. Now, of course, in your signals class, you may get a, a bit more of a precise definition, but this is a good way of thinking about it. And here are two sort of sketches of the difference between energy and power signals. So on the left, you can see two different signals that trend toward zero. And so if you take that integral from minus infinity to infinity, you will be able to find a finite number that is below this curve, and same for here. However, for these power signals, uh, they're continuously oscillating in time from minus infinity to infinity. Uh, they never approach zero, and so you'll never be able to get a finite value for the, the integral here for any of these integrals. And so therefore, for these power signals, which continue to oscillate, you'll need to define some type of period and take that uh, separate integral. So what is the application of this in communication systems? Why do you care about energy and power signals? Uh, it's, uh, one, one simple example is that if you have a message signal and you approximate it, then you can take the error as the difference of the signal and the energy or power of the error would measure the accuracy of your approximation.